Well, thank you, everyone, and I, I very much appreciate you having me, and I'm, I'm certainly uh, appreciative to be here. Um, I'm going to kind of just start off with some, some general thoughts, um, just because I know this has been stressful. I know some of you have already had some training. Um, I know some of you, you know, kind of participated in, in, uh, in some of the review that went on. So just, you know, some general things. One, um, this happens to a lot of hospitals, so this is not something that is specific to, you know, any one hospital. Two, um, this was something, uh, you know, EMTALA is, is uh, kind of an old law, and I don't mean that in, that it's stale or anything like that, but, you know, what happens, I think, particularly in any, in any area, but particularly healthcare is, you know, they put a law in place, and then um, we get all ready for that, and, you know, this law came out in the 80s, and then in the 90s, um, fraud and abuse laws come out, and we get all excited about those, and then in the 2000s, we had HIPAA, and we got all excited about those, and sometimes just kind of bringing us all back to the original laws becomes, you know, something that's important for any organization. And so a lot of people I've talked to have said, well, this is an opportunity. We've learned a lot. Um, you know, we know, we know a lot more um, maybe than we did about the law. So today I'm going to go over the basics of it, which I know, you know, many of you have experience with, but also kind of gives you some of the whys or some examples of things that have happened at other hospitals um, to give you a flavor. And I think, you know, some of you uh, in the morning, we had a huge, you know, morning session at 7.30 and, you know, there was some nodding and some, because I think it's very familiar stories. The other thing I'll say about laws in general in healthcare is, you know, laws always come from somebody's good idea and many times they are an absolutely good idea. Um, we all care about privacy, we all care about accurate billing, we all care about emergency treatment. Um, but then, you know, sometimes they're written, um, I'll just insult my group, as, by lawyers. Um, and there are very few lawyers that have ever provided an ED service, right? So we have people, and they, obviously they get input, but we have people and we kind of roll out these rules. And the practicality of them in your day, when you are extraordinarily busy, when there's a flow, I mean, you know, obviously I can make appointments all day in my calendar, right? I know where I need to be. You, you don't make appointments. People walk in when they walk in, as many of them as want to walk in at any given time. So what you do is very hard. And sometimes overlaying, you know, all of these laws on it can get very difficult. So it's more of an awareness thing, knowing that it's out there. What I always say is awareness is what leads to questions. And questions hopefully get us to answers and hopefully the right answers. And sometimes that isn't one person making the decision as to what you do in a tough spot. You get difficult decisions every day in a lot of different areas. And so sometimes it's knowing enough that, okay, this this is concerning for whatever reason, and then having an internal discussion um, between people to make sure we handle a consistency, both, consistently both in the hospital and then outside, you know, throughout the system. So that's kind of just, you know, kind of a little bit of wind up. So, you know, let's talk about, you know, when I'm telling you all know it's, it's a federal law. Um, CMS doesn't come out here, right? They send the Department of Health um, out here to do um, the review, but it's a federal law. And really it comes down to screening people, uh, stabilizing people, treating people. And it was put in place because there was, you know, dumping going on. So for those of you who remember ER, right, everyone always got sent to county. All right, it's like, oh, send them to county. They'll take care of them. They don't have insurance, send them to county. And the theory was is that that shouldn't really be happening when somebody's, you know, bleeding from their head with a knife stuck. You know, that's television, right? One of the things I will say to you is EMTALA does not apply on television. All the things you see on television are not EMTALA compliant. But when we, when we think about that, that was the issue, right? People were getting sent away um, by, you know, some hospitals, usually in a town or a city to other hospitals um, in that same town or city that um, the idea being that they were more receptive to uh, people who were not insured. However, EMTALA applies to everyone. It isn't just the uninsured. So it was put in place to really you know, apply to every patient that not just walks through our ED, but stumbles across our property and seems to need help or you know, potential patients that are eating, you know, um, in the cafeteria and then seem to need help and we'll talk about a little bit more um, about that. The, the, one of the interesting things about dumping is when I, when I teach this to um, students going um, on to medical school, um, it's interesting and in, in when this law came in place the dumping was meant to be 
you know, that you have the uninsured person and you send them to another hospital because you don't want to, uh, you don't want to provide the care or the charity care, or, you know, your doctor doesn't want to come in that's on call that day or, you know, whatever it is, and we'll talk about call later on. But um, dumping to a lot of my younger students, they think of some of the things that have happened in some major cities where you're struggling to discharge a person and they get dropped on a corner somewhere near the homeless shelter or other things like that. So that's a different kind of dumping and not necessarily what's meant, um, what's meant here. Um, but that's a whole other thing, right? The people who are difficult to discharge. And um, for those of you who have ever been involved in that, those can be very difficult um, situations. It applies to Medicare participating hospitals, which is just about everybody. Um, hard to run a hospital in this country and not take, um, not take Medicare. But that really is the hook why CMS can get involved and enforce the rules and why they can kind of send DOH out um, to do their review. It won't surprise anybody here um, because you all, you know, ha have worked or do work in, in the ED, right? 92% of hospitalizations of the uninsured involve that emergency visit, um, even though we wish it didn't many times or we know that a more appropriate, um, you know, care provider, or, you know, whatever it is, but it comes through. One of the problems with MTAL and what's been difficult um, with MTALA, especially as managed care has kind of taken flight in the way that it has, and obviously we're going to see managed care now apply to, you know, just about everyone as we start to move certain other populations that haven't had managed care um, in the state. But MTALA and managed care kind of conflict, right? MTALA says everything is an emergency until you screen and say it's not, all right? Managed care says nothing's an emergency until we tell you right, until we tell you that we want to control the care. And what Amtala says to us is no, all right, managed care for this screening purpose and this stabilizing purpose, managed care, what they think is not, we don't, we don't care. We'll take, we're forcing the risk on the hospital, okay, to provide that care. And if, and if the managed care company doesn't get into a fight, that's okay. But it's a very technical law, and it requires technical compliance. And what I mean by that is, is, you know, the, the law is there because of some intent, right? The law is there because they thought that there was, um, you know, that there was some intent to kind of send these people somewhere else. But the truth of the matter is, is that you don't have to have bad intent to have an Amtala problem. And when they come in, they really look at all of the picky parts of the rule. And I don't mean picky negatively, but there's a lot of pieces, signage and other things. And they take a look at all of those um, pieces. For any of you who have enjoyed uh, your time with Mtala, you don't have to admit it um, now. But this is actually um, the interpretive guidelines, the, the manual that's used by states like DOH, regulatory bodies in states, um, like the New York State Department of Health, when they come in and they look at us, and for those of uh, home on the camera, this is very thick and it's double-sided because we're trying to save paper at Barclay Damon now. And so um, this is all of the things, all of the guidelines that they have when they come in, and they can find any number of issues, even if we had no intent, even if we were trying to do the right thing, even if the situation that brought us here was a little unique, which I think the situation um, that we had was, so you and you don't have to have an adverse outcome. So it's not, it doesn't have to be something bad happened to the patient for us to be in, in, in trouble with Mtala. And that's really hard too, right? Because there's a, you know, we make those quick decisions all the time and we need to make them all the time and it doesn't have to be a bad outcome that brings, uh, that brings us an EMTALA issue. So it applies, as I said, to anyone, all right, not just the people in the ED, but people on the hospital campus who look like they need help, who look like they need care. Um, that involves, you know, uh, a yard radius out. I had a client once who had the bus stop on their property. And so, yep, and they had, so they had the bus stop on the property, and they were very concerned somebody was going to go down in the bus stop because all kinds of crazy things would happen over at the bus stop. And they actually determined that they actually put a camera on the corner of the hospital because they felt a need to monitor it. So it's, it's a very difficult rule because the practicality of it, right, is you control what's going on in certain places in the hospital, but, you know, people, I, I told the story, and now I'm going to put it on video, which I can't believe, but I told it. When I was a, a young a law student, I actually had um, 
a summer job in a hospital and counsel's office. And for the first three days, those nice people who had worked there for 30 years and knew everyone in the hospital and every place in the hospital would walk me to the cafeteria because I was on an administrative wing and it was a little bit of a maze um, getting me there. And then you know, day four, I decided I'm going to venture out alone. And that was before HIPAA. So really, if you had a white coat or a suit on, nobody really asked you what you were up to. You know, people just kind of let you walk through. And so I you know, took a wrong turn, and I ended up in the, in the morgue instead of the cafeteria, which is an excellent dieting. If you're dieting, that is the way to go, because um, I wasn't all that hungry after that. But you know, that's kind of the, we have people kind of wandering sometimes the halls um, in a hospital. We have people come in the wrong door. You know, they don't, you know, they take the wrong turn. They park in the parking lot I'm in instead of the one. I mean, even though the signage is very, very clear here. Um, so we need to be mindful of those people and our staff, everyone, including, you know, people in the cafeteria need to understand that if somebody looks like they need help, we need to get them um, to the appropriate place. EMTALA doesn't apply to certain things. We're going to always err on the side of having it apply. We're not going to, you know, we don't want to get into too much analysis about that. But obviously, you know, people who are coming here as inpatients or are inpatients who have scheduled visits, that's all a little bit different. We would keep them on their normal course, all right, if they needed to be get admitted quicker or something happened when they were getting registered. I mean, we would keep them on their normal course. Skilled nursing facilities, which I know many of you know, if there are hospitals or shops run by others, maybe not there, but I wouldn't you know, be too picky about that. Obviously, if somebody's wandering through the gift shop, and I don't know if it's run by a foundation or not, but if somebody's, I, you know, hey, look, if people need help, let us get you to the ED. OK, let us get you to the ED. So again, anyone who prevents, uh, presents for care doesn't, uh, immigration status does not matter. Um, it doesn't matter if you're a Medicare patient or not. I said it applied to Medicare participating hospitals, but that, that isn't the barometer. It's everybody, it, it, even if you have insurance. I mean, it's meant to kind of protect those people that people want to jettison or might want to jettison, but it protects everybody. And you don't, again, have to have a bad motive. And that's really hard because I think in healthcare, and one of the reasons I love being a healthcare lawyer is because you know, 98% of the people that I work with are outstanding people who went into this industry because they want to help people. And that's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. 2% are billing 27 hours a day um, in psych visits. That's okay. So there's, in any industry, you have people who are trying to defraud the system. But 98%, the best people you've, you either make. So that's hard because most people, when they come to work every day in healthcare, they try to do the right thing. And it's hard when there are laws that say, yeah, we know you tried, but it wasn't good enough. And so that's that. I know that's very. It can be very, very difficult. So you know, what does it mean? If somebody requests treatment or somebody looks like they need treatment, then what we're going to do is we're going to screen them. And that screening exam is really the hallmark of EMTALA. The idea that somebody has to be looked at by an appropriate professional to make a determination as to whether or not they have an emergency situation. <coughs> the triage itself at the desk that says that the person you know, who has the knife sticking out of their head is you know, of a greater concern than the person who came in and broke their arm and there's no bone sticking out. That is not the screening. OK, that is not the screening. The screening is more than that. But we can't delay that screening to find out about whether someone has coverage or not. We can't delay that screening, you'll see on a later slide, to like call someone's personal physician. We have to get that screening done. And that's where you kind of run into that managed care issue. That doesn't mean we can't register people. We can go through a reasonable registration process. But if they need that screening quicker, we're going to get it as fast as possible, depending on what we think um, is going on with the person. As I said, the request can come from anyone, family, but it also can be, just be common sense. And common sense would say that if somebody looks like they need help, we would provide it. At that point, we have to resolve the issue or stabilize the issue, or we have to transfer. But there's a very specific process that we go through if we can't stabilize the person before a transfer. And so we would need to do that. Now, this doesn't um, you know, alleviate anyone's rights. Okay, So I'm a patient. I still have rights. I can still deny care. I can walk out. And that's really hard, right, with your log. Because you got a log and people come in, and not everybody gives you the common courtesy of saying, we're leaving. Right? 
it, they treat it a little like restaurant reservations, right? You come in, you put your name on the list, they say it's 35 minutes, and then somebody's like, I'm starving, we gotta get out of here. You hope that they go up and say, can you take us off the list, but they often don't. So it's a little like that, right? People come into the ED, they decide they don't wanna wait, and they leave, and we're supposed to kind of be keeping track of those people. So that can be, um, that can be difficult. But if we don't have the capability to treat the person, we'll talk obviously more about what that means and what's supposed to happen. If we don't have the capability, we find a hospital that does. And once we find a hospital, they're supposed to take them. We'll talk about that. I know that can be a difficult process, but the truth is, is that a hospital that has that specialized capability that we don't have is required under EMTALA if they have the capacity and they have the capability to take the person. They don't get to question our judgment about making that transfer and the, uh, the other way around. When we're receiving the person, we, you leave it to the person who has the patient in front of them to determine what's safe or not, right? The other person, I mean, we all have telemedicine now and all these fancy things, but the idea is that the person who is looking at the patient has the best opportunity to make a good decision as to whether that person stays or has to be transferred. So again, you can do a basic, you know, you can admit people, you know, do that basic screening, have some reasonable registration process, um, but we're not going to delay um, making phone calls or any of those types of things. Doesn't mean we can't make the phone calls, but we're not going to delay the screening. You all know what an emergency is. Um, you know, obviously, it's, it's if there's going to be, you know, um, significant harm, bodily impairment, those types of things. And you triage every day. You triage every day. Um, emergencies have different levels of emergency, right? So, um, and, and you all know how to, how to do that. But we're gonna get that screening to everyone up and down the chain, um, you know, to make sure that um, we appropriately handle it. Obviously, there are policies for if someone is expecting that has to do with how long or how far along they are, whether that then goes to labor and delivery, who can make that screening. And it is up to us in the hospital to have our policies designate who can make those screenings. We get broad latitude there. The federal government doesn't really do a lot with that because every state somewhat is different with licensure, right? For those of you who have been in other states, you may have had a similar license, but it was called something different. Some people regulate this type of uh, professional and not another. And so they leave it very much to hospitals to determine, okay, who is qualified um, to do that screening? And then when does the physician kind of need to be um, brought in to take a look at that? So the, it's hard for people in healthcare to sometimes understand how these rules come to be or come to pass. And that can be very difficult because this law came to pass because there were actually hospitals that were coercing individuals in some cases to make a decision to go somewhere else. And I think in the very extreme part of that, what you have is a situation where hospitals were making those types of decisions, right? Because, and look, let's talk about where we are in healthcare, right? A lot of pressure in healthcare. For those of you who have been in healthcare for a long time, it wasn't always like this, right? You're being asked to do more with less. People cutting reimbursement. There's a lot of pressure on hospitals. I mean, I hate to say it, in healthcare, we didn't have to run it like a business the way that it has to be run sometimes like a business now. And so all of those things were kind of pushing people in a direction where there were actually hospitals who were saying, hey, look, he, here's a reason you shouldn't stay here. You know, you're gonna have to wait here for five hours, okay? But if you go down the street, it may only be two hours. Or, you know, here, here's an idea, and here as we go into a place where many of us, you know, or at least so many more of us are on high deductible plans, you know, hey, if you stay here, you know, we're gonna send you a bill for X, but if you go down the road, you know, they, they have a better charity care policy, or they may, you know, they may, it may be a less of a raid or whatever to get kind of you out of the hospital. The hard part is some of those conversations that might be considered EMTALA violations are actually, if you interviewed staff, they'd be like, we were trying to be helpful. Like we were trying to be helpful. We weren't trying to get rid of the person. We were trying, we were concerned about the bill that they were gonna get or we were, and so that's hard too because again, the intent doesn't matter it's on its face, and if it looks like we're coercing someone to go, 
then that is, you know, could be an EMTALA violation. So the transfer issue is really sticky. And, you know, when I give this presentation, and I gave it um, over in Binghamton to, to the physicians, and it, it's a very, very sticky situation because I think people have been on the end of the phone trying to get the person transferred and have felt a little bit of negative feedback on the phone, or sometimes not just a little. Um, or in the other situation, I've had people say they call us and try to send us people, and we really don't think they need to go. Okay, we really don't think they need to go. So that happens, and so that's important to talk about those things when they do happen and make sure that we're handling it all, of, all of it appropriately. But if the person is not stabilized, then we don't transfer. Okay, we don't transfer unless the person insists and we get that in writing, either the person or their family, if the family's making the decisions at that point, um, and we inform them of the risk. We inform them that we don't think it's a good idea, right? We inform them that it's against medical advice. And we say to them, we understand, you know, your concerns. Now, I have seen this at hospitals, right? I have seen people say, I don't know why the ambulance took me here. My ex-husband works here, and I'm never getting treated here. You know, or, you know, people come and they say, we're suing this hospital because of something that happened to my mother, and I never want to, I want out, I want to go. And those things happen, and they have a right to do that, but we're going to document right we're going to document as best we can to make sure that because many of you know who have been in healthcare for a long time sometimes people are asking you about things that happened years later you've already seen thousands of other people <laughs> come through the ED and unless it was a really unique situation the you know the ins and outs of what happened on a particular day hard to remember so that documentation becomes very important to us making sure that we have that um, or we have a physician decide, hey, look, there are risks, there are benefits, and the benefits outweigh the risk. If that happens, <coughs> sorry about that, then we can transfer. All right, but that's an analysis that we need to do, and obviously that's that's when we call the other hospital and we work that out, which we'll talk about. If I have a specialized capability. If I have an on-call physician that the hospital that's trying to send me uh, the patient doesn't have, um, then I am supposed to take that patient if, again, oops, sorry, if, again, um, I have that specialized capability and I have capacity. And sometimes um, transferring institutions have to remind um, receiving institutions of their responsibilities there. Because if you have a 10 bassinet NICU, as an example, and all 10 bassinets are filled, but if you've ever put a baby in a bassinet um, and expanded your NICU to another part of the hospital or put someone in a hallway, or you've ever increased your capacity that way to accommodate, you're expected to do that again. And so it's, it's real nice to say, um, hey, we're full, right? <laughs> oh, we're full. Right? There's no tables at the restaurant, there's no rooms at the inn. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is if you have ever expanded that. Now the difficult thing with that is, I've had some people tell me that what they think that does is it discourages hospitals um, from ever doing that. Because they know that then they're gonna have to do it again. But I think most people in healthcare would agree that you're gonna do what's best for the patient. And if that means you're gonna put another bassinet somewhere, you're gonna find a way to extend that out, you're going to take, you know, part and you're going to have, you know, your NICU nurses in another section of the hospital too, splitting time, whatever it is, um, to help the patients. And so, but, but sometimes, you know, we're full me, has to mean we're full really to whatever we consider to be the gills, right? We are full to the point where we would never accommodate another person because we think there's a risk. We've never done that before. If that's the case, then they can say, we don't have capacity. But short of that, um, they are supposed to do that. So as I say, if we've addressed occupancy before, um, then you're supposed to address occupancy again by expanding it. Obviously, um, stable, right, means that you're not going to materially deteriorate in that. Um, the transferring hospital has responsibilities. You're going to treat the person up to the point that they go. 
um, not surprisingly. You're going to give copies of the medical records. Hopefully that's a little easier with the MR, although I hear horror stories about that from people who work in your industry. Um, the transferring hospital um, obviously has to confirm that they have capacity, that they're willing to take the person, that they're accepting the transfer, and then we make transfers by qualified personnel. I get this question a lot, and it, there's no great answer to it, but what if they say, I want to go by car, I don't want an ambulance because I'm going to get an $800 bill or whatever it is the going rate um, is for the ambulance trip? And, you know, uh, the answer to that is, um, well, if the person's stabilized and we feel it's safe, um, then maybe we're a little more comfortable with it. But if we're transferring someone that we've determined has an emergency condition um, and needs to go to another hospital, we are very, we are, we are sending that person um, by ambulance or helicopter doing what we need to do. Um, but could the person object and say, I, you know, I want to go by car? I, you know, they get a certain amount of free choice and we're back to warning them about all the horrible things that we think are going to happen to them, you know, if they don't take our advice. So um, I, I would say most people that have to be transferred or a situation where we're Go, setting someone somewhere because we need a thoracic surgeon or we need whatever. I mean, those people are not going to argue going by ambulance. Or, but it gets a little harder, I think, sometimes um, as you go down the emergency chain. Um, and, you know, that's a, there's no law that says, oh, they must go by ambulance. But remember, we've said they have an emergency unless, unless we feel they're stabilized, right? And then if they're stabilized, maybe we're a little more, uncom we're a little more comfortable with that. Gra you know, distance. I'm told that when you call sometimes an institution you want to transfer to, the minute one of the first things they say is, do you know how far away we are? Are you, are you aware? And of course you are. You're very aware of the surrounding areas and how far um, things are. And distance is not a reason to deny a transfer by itself. All right? And they've been very specific about that. So if the person needs specialized care and there's capacity, they have to accept. It is up to, as I said, the doctor looking at the person, all right, the staff looking at the person to make a decision about whether or not going that distance is worth it. You know, whether those risks um, are outweighed by the benefits of getting to that person, getting that person somewhere um, where the person needs to be, where we think they will get the appropriate care. And so the receiving facility is not supposed to be picking at that judgment. And sometimes, you know, people at hospitals have discussions up the chain about that because that can be a very, you know, difficult discussion when you say, you want to know something? You're not supposed to be questioning our judgment. We have the person right in front of us. And we'll talk about some of the things that happen between hospitals um, a little bit later on. Call. So they don't tell you how much call there has to be or who has to be on call or if you have a certain number of this doctor that so uh, this many have to be on call or there's no predetermined ratio there's no guidance but if they don't like your call schedule they're more than happy to tell you about it so that's difficult all right that can be difficult you have to have a policy for gaps you have to have an idea of what you're going to do if there's unavailability I mean, and there are areas where you may have one doc, right? And then you got to figure out what you're going to do about that. You may be transferring. If that doc is out of the country, person's out of the I mean, you're not going to bring them back. So um, you have to list specific physicians on a call schedule, not a group. And the reason they do that is the same reason that when you're trained, um, you know, or when you give training, a lot of you provide training, right? When you provide, you know, CPR first aid training um, to the general masses, you know, like, you know, the lawyer who's most likely to save someone with the defibrillator, which is what I am, um, you know, the most likely person to save everybody in our office. Um, when you train, right, you train people to say that when you say call 911, you don't just blurt it out, right? You look at someone and you get eye contact and you say, you call 911. And you do that because at that point, that person feels some personal responsibility where people are far more likely, if there's a general call, right, to respond. It's the same thing. All of you would sense some duty because you're in healthcare, right? If you saw someone in the supermarket go down, you would feel the need to help. The truth of the matter is, is there's no legal duty um, unless you put that person in harm's way or there's no legal duty to that person until... I go down to one knee and I try to help them and then I have a duty to help as long as I can until I'm exhausted. And the reason for that is because when I go to help that person, the theory is when I go to help that person, a bunch of people pass by. 
So I took personal responsibility for that person. So the reason we have physicians listed is because we want the individual physician to own it and not say to themselves, you know something, Dr. So-and-so never responds to this. He can respond. You know, I've got a par going. You know, whatever. And, you know, and not say that that happened. You know what I mean. So you have to have an individual physician listed. Um, obviously, the initial screen, again, it's up to us to kind of determine what professionals can do that labor in both labor and delivery and in the ED. And then one thing I would say to you, and I always teach, you know, our, our, the younger um, physicians that I get a chance to teach, you know, this is our policies um, are the first example, you know, of what we think we should do in a given circumstance. So when we have a policy, we write it down, any regulator or court is going to say, well, this is what you thought the right thing to do was. So when we have these policies, it becomes very imperative that we follow them. Um, because it's kind of the first opportunity somebody gets to say, you were supposed to do X because you said it. You wrote it down, and you didn't do X. So understanding and kind of taking a look at those policies. But the other thing that I would say is it's really easy for life to continue, medicine to change, the way we deliver care to change, the ideas about how we deliver care to change. It's very easy for those things to progress over time. And sometimes our policies get behind. So if you're ever taking a look at a policy or you have the opportunity to take a look at it and you're, you say to yourself, I don't know why it says that or we don't really do that. Um, that is an opportunity really to raise that with somebody here at the hospital and say, you know something, we have something written down that we're really not doing. It doesn't even sometimes mean that we're supposed to be doing it. Sometimes it means life has evolved and that isn't the way we do it anymore. So, and especially as, you know, building a new ED, right? I mean, the patient flow is going to be different. All of those things end up mattering. So again, CMS won't structure call coverage. They will allow uh, surgeons to have elective surgery during that or to take call simultaneously at two places. And, you know, many of you know doctors could be on call and just never get a call. And so they allow that, but there's got to be a plan for what's going to happen. And, boy, the minute that doctor walks out of that surgery, if that is the only option, that doctor's going straight to that other surgery. So there has to be some plan for what's going to happen if we have a conflict. You know, they, they don't like particularly low levels. Okay, so we never like to pay penalties. Well, we, first of all, we don't like to do something that somebody thinks is inappropriate or wrong or doesn't comply with the law because we want to do, we want to do the right thing. We try really hard to do the right thing. We come every day, we try to do that. We also don't want to pay penalties. And there's an inflation factor in there, so it's a little bit more. Um, but there's... Um, you know, we don't want to pay a penalty. And, you know, in healthcare, you know why we don't want to pay a penalty? I mean, we never want to. Nobody, no business ever wants to pay a penalty. But in healthcare, when we pay penalties, we think of them as FTEs. <laughs> because in healthcare, we spend some money on brick and mortar, and we certainly try to buy equipment. I mean, that we, we like to buy equipment. But really, what we like to spend our money on in healthcare and human services is on people, so we can provide more care, better care. And so every time we pay money for something like this, it just hurts. It hurts because it's not, it doesn't align with our mission. It just, it seems like money that we've kind of flushed out the door. But it's not all about the money, okay? So there are other things that come from EMTALA um, that can happen. And, it, and it's unfortunate. Um, but the first thing that can happen is if I'm a patient and I did suffer harm, I did suffer harm, and DOH, CMS decides that I didn't get an appropriate screen, isn't that wonderful evidence that something went wrong at the hospital that caused my harm? Now, they've got to show causation, just like any malpractice, right? There has to be, you know, a breach of the standard of care, and it has to lead to, you know, the damages, whatever those are. So there have been cases where the hospitals have been you know, said where there's been an EMTALA, and you can't sue under EMTALA, it's like HIPAA. You can't sue under EMTALA, but what you sue under is this theory that I wasn't treated by the standard of care because I was supposed to get screened and I wasn't screened or I wasn't appropriately screened or whatever that is. And so if you have that, that's really nice evidence that someone thought you weren't screened appropriately and then you just got to link the damages to the, to, the, um, to the issue. So that's one of the things. The other thing is, 
if you're a hospital on one end or the other end of the, of the transfer, all right, and either you called and they didn't take the transfer, and then in the meantime or with the delay or while you were trying to find another hospital, something horrible happens to the person, or if you're on the transferring end and you think some bad decision has been made by the transferring institution, whatever it is. So if you're on either end of that and something bad happens to the person and you get sued, sometimes hospitals are trying to lump, trying to bring in the other hospitals. And they're trying to say, hey, look, we did everything appropriate. We screened. We determined that there was a need for specialized care. We called you. We think you had the capability and you just didn't want to call Dr. So-and-so in that day or whatever it is. And you didn't take the person and the person passed away. Don't put that on us. We tried to do it right. They're really the problem. So there's that risk. Um, and, you know, obviously it, you don't have to have the adverse outcome for those other things that you do. And again, no violation if the patient refuses examination or treatment unless there's some evidence that we coerce them to leave or we encourage them to leave in an inappropriate way. Um, but you're going to document, 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 right? The person's refusal, you know, that we warned them of risk, that we told them they had the right to the screening, all of those types of things. You know, a third of hospitals have been investigated. So, I mean, it is very common. It is very, very, very common. And there's not a lot of due process. So, you know, in all honesty, when they come, um, there's so many reasons that go into what happens in healthcare and the unique situations. And we love to try to tell people about that. But the truth of the matter is, is when they come in, they look for the violations. And if the violations are there, what they want you to say in all honesty is, we're really sorry, we'll change our practices, we'll train everyone again, and we'll do better. Um, and that's very hard sometimes because sometimes the story behind the alleged violations is bigger than what they maybe might want to take a look at. But I think most people then get to the point where they say, well, there was something for them to see and we'll do the right thing, which is obviously what, um, you know, all hospitals do. So it won't surprise you, right? These are the most common settlements, right? Failure to screen, failure to stabilize, an inappropriate transfer, not taking an appropriate transfer, turning somebody away for financial status. I can't tell you the number of doctors um, that have documented, you know, in a hospital setting, you know, don't do charity care. Or, you know, or I can't tell you the number of doctors that, you know, have, have said things, like they've just outwardly said things that are actually EMTALA violations. And then, and I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying um, do things that are inappropriate, just don't document them, right? I would never say that. But I'm amazed sometimes at the things that get people in trouble, the things that people write down. So being aware you know, of that, or obviously the on-call doctor you know, doesn't come in. And they can um, penalize physicians. It's not just hospitals. They can penalize physicians. And, and when we do the physician training, you know, we talk about that um, and the ways that, that physicians have been uh, penalized, you know, under EMTALA. So, you know, just the basic stuff that all the people who work here need to know. Um, you know, if you see someone who looks like they need help, do you want to see a doctor? Let me get you to the ER. Um, logging all the patients in the ED, doing our best with that. I know that's hard. The coming, the going, the busy, the whatever. We're going to do our best with that. Um, you know, everything in compliance. HIPAA, fraud and abuse, all the things that I talk about, didn't write any of the laws, so don't blame me for them. But all of the things that I talk about really is just about doing your best. <laughs> trying to be aware, trying to use common sense, being aware of what's out there. Um, you know, making sure that we give that screening examination. If we can't or we don't, if they leave, if they refuse, we document why. Um, obviously, on call, people responding appropriately and in an appropriate amount of time, and we have very specific time requirements in our policies about how long it should take to get the person, how long the person it should take for the doctor to get here. You know, those things we want to be adhered to, you know, adhered to. Obviously transfers, we talked about it. If you have the capacity, and that means if you've ever done it before, um, you're supposed to take them. And documenting those communications and those things because it becomes important um, later on. Not everyone should have a bat phone to report other hospitals, okay? so. If you have concerns or you see concerns, raise that with supervisory staff. 
There are a number of times where people on the medical staff will talk to other people on the medical staff, and the decision as to when to report or, you know, a hospital, whatever, that has to be made consistently throughout the system. So we want to make sure that those things are done you know, in a very consistent way, but if you ever have concerns about anything that happens, um, obviously raise them. The best thing ever, right, in compliance and all of those things is what we're always trying to do in compliance is just do it better tomorrow than we did it today. That's all we can do. All right, we can't, never going to be perfect. If you want, perfection exists in things that are less hard than this, okay? So we're never going to be perfect, but if we have concerns or we think we can do things a little bit better, then we just raise the issues and we talk about it. And the best decisions are made when people talk, and that's what we want to do. And that is my presentation. And um, thank I, I very much appreciate being here today. And I know you are busy and have a million things to do um, that you know may not. And some of you are actually not here today, um, but you're here today. So um, I very much appreciate your time. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.